It's safe to say that we've had a year of very frothy markets. And by frothy, I mean generally high valuations for stocks. Right now, as we approach the end of 2021, the situation is no different. Although technically, as economies have reopened and profits have reappeared in companies that were affected by the crisis, the S&P 500 P ratio has dropped. On a price to sales basis though, which may paint a more consistent view, we've seen the S&P 500 reach its highest point in almost two decades. For context, the multiple has almost doubled from 2015 as well. We're now at 3.1 times sales for the index and with an average profit margin of 9.3% for the S&P 500, that seems very expensive to me. Or whilst the estimates for economic growth are not dissimilar to what we saw back in 2015 and 2016, So that would indicate that on a relative basis, today's market is almost twice as expensive as it was five years ago. And if we lived in an efficient world, well then the overall expected investment return would theoretically be much worse over the next few years than in the years that just preceded us. Additionally to the S&P 500, the NASDAQ price to sales has also more than doubled from five years ago. And so it's no surprise that we're beginning to see some weakness in a lot of the main contributors to such high valuations. In many cases, we're seeing stock prices fall and the multiple of sales or earnings even reduce. The wider investment community would probably refer to these businesses or culprits as growth stocks. And although the majority of these stocks will be deserving of a valuation trim, there definitely will be some opportunity in the wider sell-off. And by opportunity, I'm in a chance to buy a great business at an average or even reasonable price. This method, Warren Buffett and other investment legends say, trumps most others, especially buying average businesses at good prices, which over the long term tends to return average results. If I can just add a bit of context, it would be that there are some businesses that possess such high business quality and attributes such as, say, network effects, extreme scaled economics, and deep economic moats that tend to almost always sell at a sizable premium to the market average. And understanding why they do and whether it's justifiable allows you to capitalize on what others might not see as an opportunity. One prime example is Costco, which currently sells at a premium to the market, but has done for a number of years due to its high quality business model and seemingly impenetrable moat. It's selling at a peg ratio of around five meaning that the multiple of earnings is five times larger than the expected growth rate of the business. Something that people would be disgusted at if it was, say, IBM or Intel. But because it's Costco, it's something that is widely accepted. Another example is Visa and MasterCard, who in recent history have almost always been credited with a premium valuation due to the qualities that their businesses possess. And without going into huge detail, in recent history, both of these businesses have been deserving of such valuations. They offer stability due to their moats and predictable growth and cash flow for their shareholders. And so with that intro out of the way, the topic of this video really is going to be a business that I feel possesses a vast amount of quality and is probably deserving of a premium valuation to the rest of the market. And that business is PayPal. PayPal has been getting punished in the recent sell-off. You can see it's down 30% in the past six months and 20% just in this month alone. The real question will be, has the valuation dropped to a reasonable enough level to warrant buying today? And the sell-off did bring PayPal to my attention, but I'd also previously done a valuation on PayPal and it's dropped to around where I estimated the fair value to be. So let's just provide a little bit of background on PayPal and its business before we start getting into the valuation and talking about whether it's a good opportunity to buy today. And so PayPal at its core provides consumers and merchants with payment processing, credit and lending, and a digital wallet. It has a number of products and brands that it offers this through, but what you need to know fundamentally is that they make the vast majority of their revenue through transaction fees. That's really what makes the business tick. More than 90% of revenue is from transaction fees, to be more specific. And so although buying with PayPal is free and costs nothing to the consumer, the merchant or seller of the product or services is charged a small percentage fee of the total transaction volume. And in addition to free purchasing, consumers get things like peer-to-peer transfers, buy now, pay later, cryptocurrency and investing, plus many more. And it's mostly all free like I say, in their PayPal digital wallet, which is obviously of huge value to consumers, including myself. 
And this leads to, as you would expect, huge demand from consumers to use their products and then a large number of active accounts. And we should all know by now that with two-sided marketplaces or networks, the sellers of products and services tend to go wherever the consumers are. So inevitably, they choose to partner with PayPal and gain access to its 400 million plus active consumers, which allows more consumers to use PayPal as a means of payment on those platforms or with those sellers, and then leads to more overall transaction volume on the platform, which they monetize off of. Maybe the best recent example of this is Amazon partnering with PayPal to accept Venmo at checkout, allowing users to purchase on Amazon using their digital wallet. This is a prime example of a huge seller of products or a huge marketplace essentially accepting PayPal at checkout, which will inevitably lead to more PayPal transactions overall. So you have this two-sided business model that has true network effect attributes, and by network effect, I mean that the product gains additional value, becoming more valuable to both sides, the consumer and the sellers, as more people use it. The additional power to this is that every additional user and additional transaction through PayPal comes at a little less unit cost than the previous one, demonstrating its economies of scale as well. So there's a benefit to the consumer, there's a benefit to the seller, and there's a benefit to PayPal in having more users on the platform. Something we really only see in very high quality businesses like Visa and MasterCard, Facebook, YouTube, Google, and some others, and it's, it's clear that PayPal has it. So just looking at their past financials, you can see the unique ability PayPal has to grow its revenue consistently every single quarter, and it's not on small numbers either. PayPal now does 25 billion in annual revenue, making it larger than the likes of MasterCard in that respect. But getting on to some of maybe the going concerns around PayPal's business and its future, we need to look at what's caused the sell-off in PayPal stock and whether it's going to have a meaningful impact on the business going forward, or if it just tells us that the drop was justified and there's no opportunity here. So the first, what I'd call catalyst for the drop, of course, we don't know 100% if this is why PayPal has lost over 20% of its value, but I'm assuming so, is eBay coming away from using PayPal to pay their sellers and transitioning to a competitor in Adyen, which is a, a European payments provider, which allows direct payment into sellers' bank accounts. And although this sounds easier and more direct, it actually comes with some issues to sellers and merchants on eBay's platform, like a, a longer waiting period for payment and potentially more fees for them to incur. So it's not necessarily a benefit to the sellers or users of, of PayPal that are on eBay, it's more a benefit to eBay per se. And although this has had a near-term effect on PayPal's business, reducing their year-over-year -year quarterly revenue growth to around 13% because eBay obviously previously made up around 7% of their total revenue, uh, it should start to become less of a headwind on growth though because eBay has now sunk to 3% of total revenue and the year-over-year -year growth excluding eBay was actually 25% year-over-year. That's actually bigger growth than, than most of the quarters previously. So if we take eBay out of the equation, the business, even in recent times, is doing just as well as it has previously. And so it's not all doom and gloom, but it does give us some warning signs as to what could happen if marketplaces or big facilitators of commerce start to transition away from PayPal in the future. Other than that, we have the fact that PayPal has been selling at a rich valuation since the pandemic started. Of course, it was seen as one of the big beneficiaries of the new economy, if you can put it that way. But in my opinion, 40 to 50 times forward free cash flow is way too pricey for a business that's growing at around 20%. And we're now at 35 times forward free cash flow with that underlying growth excluding eBay of say 25%, that starts to sound a little bit more compelling to me just depending on, on how much they can keep that growth rate up and, and how long growth will be sustained for. Now, before we get into the valuation, I should probably mention that in one of PayPal's recent investor presentations, they gave long-term guidance that they were aiming to grow the business at around 20% for the next five years. A 20% CAGR getting them to over 50 billion in revenue by 2025 whilst also expanding their operating margins and growing earnings per share at over 22%, something that seems plausible given where the uh, business is today and the expected growth of digital wallets and digital transactions in the future. Also on the bottom line, we know this is a business model that should have and has in the, and has in the past 
had better or improved unit economics with growth and scale, evidenced in its expanding margins. Unless it takes the route, and I'm just putting this out there, of reducing its take rate in line with its improved economics to lower the cost of transactions that the sellers pay. We can see here that their take rates actually reduced from around 2.2% in Q2 2020 to around 1.9 or 1.8% in Q3 2021. So the take rate's gone down. I don't think it's been done on, on purpose. I think it's something that has just happened as a result of having larger merchants at, at larger marketplaces using PayPal. But it is something that they could factor in going forward. And this would have, in my opinion, just as positive effects for the business value in my eyes uh, going forward, just because of the, the competitiveness that it would give it in pricing, especially when the environment, let's face it, is becoming more and more competitive as the months and, and years go on. But taking that information and making some of our own assumptions, we have here a DCF analysis on PayPal stock, which is close to mirroring management's five-year expectations I just talked about, although there is the chance they could do worse than expected or, of course, even beat expectations. So it's all hypothetical, but this indicates really what would need to happen for PayPal to be a good stock to buy today and what sort of return we could expect if they achieve these metrics here. And so the first thing I'll point out is that we get to that 50 billion plus in revenue by 2025. Personally, I think they will continue to grow at a 20% rate going forward. If we see the gross payment volumes at or around 25 to 30%, the take rate is lower than in previous years, so that actually reduces revenue growth, say excluding eBay, down to 20% or around that amount. But I think going forward, if the take rate stabilizes, then we should quite convincingly see a 20% growth into the future. And remember, it's a very big TAM. So the TAM's expected to grow at around 20% as well. So as long as PayPal isn't losing market share, then it should be able to achieve these top line metrics. That brings us then on to the bottom line uh, and where we should see some improvement in the operating margin. They put in that investor presentation that they expect to see some margin expansion, which we've seen previously with the company as well. We know it benefits from economies of scale with this business. And so with current trailing 12 month margins at around 17 and a half percent, this is obviously 2020 figures. So ignore that for now. 17 and a half percent, I think by 2025 we should see close to 20% margins, if not even higher than that, if the take rate stabilizes. And then I know they said that they wanted to see 10 billion or more in free cash flow by 2025, but I think realistically, if we're taking their cash flow conversion uh, from previous years, because remember, this is a low capex business, all those non-cash items that are taken off of the income statement aren't necessarily going out uh, of the business and uh, realistically are kept in their bank account. So if we take the previous year's metrics in terms of their free cash flow conversion as a percentage of operating income, we can see that it averages around 140% or 147% to be exact. So actually what I'm going to do is, because I do think they're sandbagging a little bit, what I'm going to do is take that average of 147, take that as the cash flow conversion going into 2025. We can change it at the end just to see what impact it has. Uh, I'm going to go with that. And then, then with that, I'm estimating that they could produce anywhere close to 15 billion in free cash flow by 2025. We apply a 25 times price to free cash flow ratio to that, and then we get an enterprise value or market cap of around 400 billion for the business in four to five years. And actually, because of how late we are in the year and how this is discounting it back, if they don't reach this number until 2026, then actually it will still come up with a very similar result. And remember what we spoke about at the beginning of this video, a 25 times multiple for a business that, like I said, with PayPal, they've always sold at a premium to the market, realistically never sold for less than 30 times trailing 12 months free cash flow, or they haven't done for a very long period of time. We saw a similar thing with some similar companies like Visa and MasterCard, where they always sell at a premium. So, you know, if that multiple expands above, say, 25 times, then we get an even bigger expected market cap close to 500 billion in 2025 as well so it does start to get more compelling if you factor in that the multiple could sustain going into the future it's not always going to contract like we estimate in a lot of these dcfs just to give us some element of conservativeness now getting on to the fair value and why this seems quite compelling is that this gives us an intrinsic value for the business at the moment of our out around 208 billion 
or a share price of $175 per share. It's currently $185 per share. And you know this is off of a 15% discount rate. Some people might want to use a 10% discount rate. Just reminding everyone, I like to use my discount rate as an opportunity cost of capital, a hurdle rate of return. So if my target rate of return is 15%, then I use a 15% discount rate or 15% hurdle rate, which then hints to me, if I wanna get a 15% rate of return and all of these assumptions up here are gonna happen, then well, I need to buy at this price. So that's the reason behind me using the 15% discount rate. But if you wanted to use a 10% discount rate, then yes, PayPal does look like it is very much undervalued based off of these assumptions up here. And 10% for a lot of people, if you're owning a quality business like PayPal, we talked about the quality of its business and the attributes it has. 10% discount rate may well be justified. So my take on it is it's very compelling. It's dropped to a very compelling price. Personally, I would like to see a little bit more of a margin of safety just because of the multiple expansion assumptions that I've put in there that I think they can achieve, but they are an assumption of mine, not necessarily something that is bound to happen. It does possess a lot of qualities, a lot of qualities that I think make it a very special business that will always sell a very premium valuation. So whether we actually see the stock drop further from here, I'm not 100% sure, but realistically, it's still selling at around 35 times next year's free cash flow. So it's not really cheap, and I'd probably like to see it drop below 170 for me to get really interested in picking up a position in PayPal. But that's just me being maybe a little bit greedy. We might see it drop below 170, and I'm gonna be keeping a very close eye on PayPal going forward. Hopefully we see some more weakness in the stock and I can add it to my portfolio because it's a business that, like I've probably got across, I would love to own if the price is right. So that is all for today, guys. Thank you to everyone who's made it this far. Hopefully you enjoyed all the insights on PayPal. I will leave a link to the Patreon down below so you can get access to this valuation model here, plus the IRR calculation, and you will get, obviously, all of the other valuations that I've done here on the channel, plus many more, as well as some exclusive analysis and Discord server and many more. So go ahead and check that out if you're interested. Apart from that, I'd appreciate if you can leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new around here, comment down below, let me know what you think of PayPal. And other than that, I'll see you all in the next video. Good luck with all of your investments.